One material is embedded in all of our daily lives. We touch it over a thousand times every day, but hardly notice it, glass. Not just a screen, glass forms the connecting tissue that is powering the digital world. From microchips and optic fiber cables to giant satellite lens and panels, which enables us to peer into the farthest reaches of space. So from the microchip to the fingertip, a lot of what's between and beyond is made possible by Corning Glass. The company is the inventor of the sturdy, brake-resistant Gorilla Glass, which has found its way into 8 billion devices, including Apple iPhones. The 150-year-old New York-based firm, which made the first glass encasement for Thomas Edison's revolutionary bulb, is preparing for what it calls the era of glass, with the coming of interactive surfaces, augmented reality surfaces and more. In the first quarter of this year, the company's revenue surged to nearly $4 billion, which has given it the confidence to close the year with sales worth $15 billion, its strongest year ever. Nobody can tell us more about the glass of the future and the future of glass than John Bain, the head of Corning's mobile consumer electronics division, who believes Corning is yet to make the ultimate glass. John, what I want to talk to you about is, uh, you know, I think, you know, mobile phones, at least for large parts of the world and for a large number of people like us, uh, it's been part of life for several years now. But what the pandemic really did was highlight the fact this is no longer discretionary. This is an essential item. This was our window to the world and this was our access to just getting life uh, done. I mean, from ed tech to health tech to fintech, everything is now uh, accessible and available on our mobile phones. And that's changed the game completely. How do you read the many changes that we've seen accelerated through the course of the pandemic on account of this? Well, we all know that we're in the era of the, the, era of the digital life. And I think the pandemic demonstrated the importance of connectivity. The world had to stay connected through video, through working at home, through going to school at home, and that really drove an increase in mobile consumer electronics and also connectivity through optical fiber, things that Corning does very well. In fact, Corning likes to say we're part of the microchip to the finger chip. Mm -hmm. We make components that enable the semiconductor industry, so there's eight to ten chips in your phone, maybe more. We enable those chips. We enable the optical fiber that transmits the data throughout the world and the fingertip part is your actual mobile consumer device. So I think the pandemic demonstrated the importance of connectivity, but also that glass enables that connectivity. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about the glass in just a second, but let me address the chip story, because that was the story of, uh, of the pandemic. I don't think I've had as many conversations where people talked about the chip shortage uh, and the need for greater supply chain resilience uh, uh, to factor in the kind of disruptions that we saw. Do you believe that the worst is now behind us? And, and what do you see as far as the future is concerned? Well, I think what happened was there was a little bit of a supply shock and a little bit of a demand shock at the same time. So people slowed down the production of chips at the beginning of the pandemic because nobody knew what to expect. At the same time, the increase in mobile consumer devices and chips are everywhere. They're in cars, microwaves, refrigerators, all around us. The world functions on chips, so a little bit of a supply shock, a little bit of a demand sh shock just aggravated the shortage of chips throughout the world, and then we had some natural disasters with weather that also impacted the supply chain. So I think the world realized how important semiconductor chips are to progress. And we take great, great pride in Corning because we actually enable that semiconductor supply chain in multiple ways. One, you need lasers to make chips. You use lasers to write the circuitry on yeah. chips. And for example, this is a product of PRISM here that we make in Corning that's used in a laser module to make chips. So that's one way we play. The second way is to write chips, you need uh, photolithography. Right. And we make the optics in some of the world's most advanced photolithography systems, and they're writing down features three nanometers on the most advanced chips. You can't do that without glass. And by the way, a human hair is 80,000 nanometers, and they're writing down to three nanometers. So the, the scale that they have to go to is incredible. And then we also make the optics to inspect the chips in the wafer. So three different areas in semiconductor manufacture 
manufacturing are enabled by Corning. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of semiconductor manufacturing and, uh, and the role that Corning is playing there, uh, have you changed strategy in any shape or form uh, given the disruptions that we've seen to ensure that you, know, you get past the challenges of the last two and a half years? And more importantly, uh, you know, India's put out a semiconductor policy, for instance, and I know uh, the U.S. at this point in time is working on the CHIPS Act and the FABS Act, and a lot of other countries are looking at this as well. Uh, how do you see this playing itself out as countries look more insular from a chip manufacturing perspective and the role that Corning can play as well? Well, historically, chips have grown at about the rate of GDP, and therefore wafer fab equipment, which is the market we sell into, has grown about the same rate. Because of the importance of semiconductors and the advancements, we think that growth rate will go to about two, two times GDP longer term. But we've seen double-digit growth the last couple of years in this year. So GDP, strong growth now leveling out, leveling out to two times GDP. So that investment, as you pointed out, will be made in different countries throughout the world. Some countries are turning more in, inward to invest in semiconductor. Our job is to make sure we're not constraining the industry. So we've uh, aggressively invested in some of our factories to be sure we're not the gating item, as well as advancing our technology to make sure we can enable the next-gen nodes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, glass, and, and 2022 is the year of the glass. I did not know about that, but, uh, uh, you know, take me through what's looking exciting on that front and link that back to the story that we just spoke of, of, uh, of where the semiconductor business is actually headed and the semiconductor story is headed uh, and the microchip to fingertip story for you. Well, Corning thinks every year should be the year of glass because it's such a transformative I would imagine. <laughs> but we were very uh, pleased and honored to see the, the UN designate 2022 as the International Year of Glass. So with respect to microchip to fingertip, um, you know, as I said, semiconductors are so important. So for Corning, it's being able to enable these advanced nodes at the very smallest dimensions. And then that's a big part of our glass. And once again, we're innovating and expanding, which is driving some of the growth of Corning. From there, the data, actually, whether you send a, a social media picture, participate on social media, make a video call, a phone call, that data goes down optical fiber. And Corning was the first company back in the 70s to develop low-loss optical fiber. It's a growth business for us then. It's a growth business to, today. Why? 5G requires a tremendous amount of fiber. Hyper data centers where all this data is being parsed and spread out around the world requires a lot of fiber. And What's interesting here is I actually have a piece of this optical fiber, not sure if you can see it. It's about the diameter of a human hair. Mm -hmm. And to transmit the data, a laser pulses down this fiber 10 billion times a second. Wow. Not only one wavelength, but up to 100 wavelengths. So you have 100 lasers pulsing 10 billion times a second, going down something the diameter of a human hair. So once again, the numbers are staggering. And then eventually, that goes onto your phone where Corning's glass enables the display in the phone to function, but also the Gorilla Glass protects the phone often on the front and the back. So Corning plays throughout this microchip to fingertip in multiple places, and the numbers are just staggering. You know, uh, 8 billion devices have used Gorilla Glass, and you touch your phone 2,000 times a day. So you got nanometer scale, you have lasers pulsing 10 million times a second, you got people touching their phone 2,000 times a day. So these numbers are really impressive numbers, and Corning helps uh, enable that entire ecosystem. You know, uh, uh, yes, and, and those numbers are staggering. But what I want to understand from you, John, you talked about 5G uh, as well as the sort of uh, many uh, tech innovations that we are seeing. What is that going to mean in terms of changes to the form factor, for instance? Uh, you know, uh, what should we be ready and prepared for? Well, some people look at the explosion of the smartphone. And today, I think roughly 6.6 .6 billion people out of 8 billion have a, a smartphone, so 83% of the world. And we love the rest to get it because it really is enabling. It's almost a basic human right to connect to the Internet yeah. now for education, e-commerce. In fact, India, 35 billion transactions online last year. So the numbers are, are really bearing out that it's important to have connectivity for everybody. So. That's driving the smartphone. People say, well, is smartphone market starting to mature? But there's new markets, new opportunities. So augmented reality, we've heard about it forever. I think the time is coming very soon, if not right now, where augmented reality will become a mainstream product. Maybe for entertainment, but more for education or mm -hmm. productivity. You know, you could remotely be fixing a machine in one part of the world and somebody's directing you in another part of the world. We've done this at Corning. So augmented reality is going to be big. And you need glass, high index of reflection glass to make that happen. 
Another area of growth is bendable display. So we have one here, which is on the market now. So this uses a lot of glass. It uses glass for the display, uses glass to protect, to make the display, glass to protect the display, and also glass on the outside. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how these take off. But if they do take off, Corning will definitely participate in that market. And then thirdly, glass for vehicles, electrification of vehicles. So these vehicles want to be lightweight so they can go further on a charge. And Gorilla Glass is very strong, so you can actually make the exterior components, the glass components of that car, thinner to save weight. And the inside, we're seeing more displays inside mm. of the vehicle. You also need strong glass there for safety reasons and to form it into these really interesting curves and shapes to conform to the front of the cockpit of a car. So we see multiple areas where we're going to see continued growth in glass. Well, you know, in talking about the electric vehicle story, and we're here in the, 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 the home of Tesla and, and Elon Musk and so on and so forth, but how do you see that story playing itself out, especially in the context of the global environment and uh, the move towards electrification? Of course, you know, high oil prices, pushing consumers also to explore that option and that possibility. Uh, affordability of the product itself. I mean, uh, from an input perspective, what do you believe we can possibly see happen on that front? Well, first of all, um, Corning participates in the catalytic converter market. We actually make cellular ceramics which protect the environment. We've kept billions of tons of bad material out of the atmosphere for years. As we see this transition from gas-powered vehicles or diesel-powered vehicles to hybrids to electrification, as that plays out, we'll see more and more focus on keeping the bad particulates out of the atmosphere. So we're seeing uh, increased demand for some of our traditional products to keep those emissions clean in the hybrid space. So that actually will help Corning. Then as we move to electrification, in a, in a traditional car, there's maybe $15 of Corning content in the cellular ceramic to protect the environment. As we transition to more glass, mm. that traditional cellular ceramic will decrease as we go to all electric vehicles, but now there's going to be more glass in the car, and we could see uh, scenarios where there's up to $100 of glass content in a vehicle. So for Corning, going from $15 to $100 of content because it's more glass-based is really exciting for us. And I think that um, that will play a role for us in terms of our growth story, but also to enable electrification because it's very compelling if you step into a car and as opposed to a traditional cockpit with just you know yeah. ga gas gauge and speedometer and a glove box, which nobody has gloves or maps in there, right, and the poor passenger's looking at a dead space, that whole cockpit could be an interactive display. So it's super exciting for us. But once again, the way we can help is to make sure the lightest weight glass possible to help that car be more efficient, use less energy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, you talked about some of the compelling growth bets that you are making at Corning, and I want to link that back to the innovation story, which has kept this company alive uh, for a good part of 170 years. Uh, through the pandemic, and, and especially uh, given the growth opportunities that you now foresee, is there is there any reframing of of the way that you shape innovation within the company or the bets that you're making? Very interesting question. So, our strategy is all about stability and growth. We want to be stable to go through the volatile times. Like right now, the world's going through a very volatile time. So we make sure our balance sheet is built for stability, but we always invest in growth. In fact, we out-invest our peer group by a factor of two in research and development because we know you have to invest in the good times and the bad times. Now, the way we do that is we focus on our core competencies, which are glass, glass ceramics, and optics. And we've developed some very unique manufacturing platforms to make those glass and ceramic products. And then we target markets, for example, that have a megatrends, life science, mobile consumer electronics, displays, optical communications, and, uh, and, auto and auto sector. So it's a combination of three core technologies, four manufacturing platforms, and five targeted markets that drives our growth prioritization. And as long as the things we're investing in play to two of the three or all three of them, that's typically how we focus our growth. And that, that formula served us very well, especially over the last 20 years where we've seen dramatic growth for Corning.